Welcome everyone to our weekly COVID-19 Q&A with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubé. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Of course, thanks for having me. My pleasure. My name is Dilshad Burman. I'm a writer and reporter with City News and City News 680, and I will be moderating this chat today. Uh, now, the way it goes is we've been collecting your questions over the past few days for the doctor. She's never seen them before. She's going to answer them off the cuff. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so in the live chat, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the 30-minute uh, period that we have with the doctor. This week's topic is the Omicron uh, variant. There's always something happening with a coronavirus, as the doctor and I have been chatting about. Um, and so we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can regarding this new development. Um, doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. All right, let's start with Wings's question. Wings is one of our regular contributors from day one. So thank you for sticking with us, Wings. Um, his, uh, their question is, how was the Omicron variant created? Um, was it caused by low vaccination rates in South Africa? And can highly vaccinated countries also create variants? Okay, so good question. So variants, what that means is that the virus has essentially changed. It's changed or mutated. And that's what viruses do. Viruses actually change. They mutate. They're always trying to uh, better themselves, I guess. And so, but every time a virus infects another person, when it continues to spread, that is when the change or the mutation can happen. So that is how variants develop. So when we block the spread of the virus, we can actually also block the spread of creating new variants. And that's why actually getting high vaccination rates around the world will help us uh, to protect against future variants being formed. So if you have a highly vaccinated population, if COVID is not spreading, you're less likely to get variants uh, created there. Right, absolutely. But as we've seen, if it happens in another part of the world, it's going to get here sooner or later because that's just the nature of it, right? People are traveling or it's, it's a virus. You can't really keep it in one place. Well, that's certainly what COVID has shown us is we are extremely connected. What may occur in a small town somewhere, anywhere in the world, actually is of global significance. And so, yes, it really speaks to how interconnected we are and how we really need to handle this as, as a global, as a world community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's move on to Jasper's question. Jasper says, how did it get into Canada if all the travelers are supposed to have a negative PCR test before they enter the country? Well, I think that's how it was certainly detected, right? It was detected through that screening that occurs when travelers come back. Mm -hmm. And yes, travelers are, even if they're fully vaccinated and they have traveled, are still required to do uh, the testing that is recommended by the federal government. Right. I mean, it, it got here because people are traveling and, and like you said, it was detected because of the test. Absolutely. Um, OK, let's take some live questions coming in right now. Uh, one from our website here from Anonymous. Um, what is the risk posed to those who are vaccinated, including children aged five and older? Um, and what are the risks posed to children who are too young to be vaccinated? I'm assuming uh, on the new variant. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're still, you know, there's still actually a lot that we don't know. So I'm sorry that this will be unsatisfying for many, but we're still trying to find out more. What we do know, though, is that from the variants that we've had in Ontario, so we had the original strain of COVID, and then in the spring we had the Alpha variant, and then the Delta variant took over after that in the summer. And of these three different strains of COVID that we've had, the vaccines have worked, actually. They have provided good protection. And even we know that there were other strains that were circulating. At one point, we called it the Brazil variant. There was also what we had previously called the South African variant uh, before the WHO changed the nomenclature. The vaccines still worked against them. And so we are, uh, you know, so vaccines even can work even when there is a variant. The way the vaccines work is they they give you, they recognize the spike protein. So even if there are changes in the spike protein, as long as the general structure of the spike protein is recognized by the body, your body's antibodies and the immune system will respond. And so sometimes even if you have uh, a big change in a variant, there can be what we call cross protection. We see that with the influenza virus, for example. And so that you can still get enough protection to keep you, say, out of hospital. Now, we don't know 
how sick this variant will make you. We don't know what impact it will have on children, including children who may not be vaccinated. And that is exactly why we have to fall back to our first principles. Again, wearing that mask, keeping a distance, preventing those indoor gatherings, you know, staying home when we're sick, getting tested as much as possible. Those we know work, they work against the other variants, they will work again with this variant very likely. Right, okay. Um, and then let's go to another live question from Connie on our website. Uh, do we now have to be tested twice when traveling, 72 hours before leaving the destination, and then once again when we come back to Canada? The travel requirements are changing, and they are changing quite often. So uh, I, I certainly don't want to quote it, because if you leave a week from now, it may be different. We've huh. seen even yesterday they added different countries. So even if you travel to some of those countries that are on the list, and you're fully vaccinated, you will have to quarantine for 14 days. Right. So I think the best advice I can give you is before you travel, as you're planning to travel, find out the restrictions now mm -hmm. before you travel. And then when you travel, uh, updates, they may have changed by then. Better yet, if you don't need to travel for essential reasons, you know, you can consider where you're going and, and restrict some of your travels, especially if you're traveling with people who are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then let's take, I know we just sort of talked about it, but let's take Frank's question. Um, what is Omicron's infectiousness um, to unvaccinated and vaccinated people? And also, is it more sort of um, likely to infect people of a certain age? Like, is it targeting older people or younger people? Yeah, so we don't exactly know that. I mean, we saw with the Delta variant that it spread even more than the Alpha variant before that. Yeah. So it was more contagious. We saw that the Delta variant could make people more sick. Mm -hmm. um, and that meant that the people who were going to get severely sick from COVID, like the elderly, could get more sick, for example. Mm -hmm. We don't have those details yet for this new variant. And we'll have to, to wait and see. There are some reports, you know. Um, and it's hard to know until you actually collect all of the data to be able to say what you're what you're finding in terms of how easily it spread and how severe it can make people. Okay. Um, and, and then let's move on to Daniel's question. Daniel asks, uh, why should we take the booster if it doesn't work against this variant? It seems like there'll be never ending boosters coming along and we don't know the long term effects of taking a series of boosters. Okay, so the reason to get a booster is because the immunity that you have has waned. It's not, the vaccines are providing some protection, but not the best protection. And we know that boosters can, again, boost that immune response and give you that better protection. Mm -hmm. We will have to wait to see whether the vaccines, this vaccine can provide that optimal protection against the, the variant. Uh, you know, the manufacturers have said, if there's a new variant, very different, need a special vaccine, they will produce that vaccine. But right now we don't have that data. And we know that there is evidence for waning immunity. And that's why we should get the booster doses. I mean, Delta is still our predominant uh, COVID that is spreading in Ontario. And that is the reason if you are recommended to get a booster, to get the booster now. Um, and then let's move on to uh, some of the questions that we've sort of aggregated over the last little week. Um, how much more transmissible is the new Omicron variant? <clears throat> so we don't know how much more transmissible it is. One of the, the, so variants, again, are mutations or changes, and we expect to see variants. We call it a variant of concern, a VOC. It's a variant of concern. If it has those features, it can spread more easily, it can make more people sick. You know, that means that it can actually take over. It can be the new type of COVID virus. And so that, you know, that is something that we have to actually wait for the science to do their tests to be able to inform us on, on how much more easily it, it, it spreads. So, but doctor, when you say it's been recognized as a various variant of concern, so then by default, we sort of can understand that it is probably more transmissible? Is that is that why it's considered a variant of concern? 
There are a number of criteria that can make it a variant of concern. Like, for example, this one has a number of mutations on the spike protein. Uh, it has taken over in one part of the world where it was detected. You know, So there are a number of other reasons why it has been declared a variant of concern. But remember, we saw other variants of concern in the spring, right? We saw what we had called back then the Brazil variant. That never came here, for example, right? It never became our predominant variant. We had cases of that variant here, even in our own city, but it did not take off as the main variant. Um, so I think that's also important to note. Right, right. Um, and then I guess, again, we've sort of talked about this, but let's do it anyway. Will the current vaccines give us enough protection against this new variant? We don't have all of the answers there, but we know that, again, vaccines can provide protection against the Delta variant, a very good protection. And even if we don't have full protection against this new variant, sometimes vaccines can give you cross protection. They can give you just enough protection to keep you from getting very sick sometimes. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned that the new variant has significant mutations. What exactly does that mean? So what that means is that the virus has changed and it's really, really where you want to look for the changes is on the spike protein. So the virus is there, the virus has these spikes coming out of it. It's the spike protein that is what uh, attacks you and actually develops an infection. It's also the way in which the vaccines work. The vaccines recognize the spike protein, see that that spike protein is not supposed to be a part of my body and attacks it to get rid of the infection. And so that's the changes in the spike protein are what we keep a close eye on, because if it's changed quite a lot, your body may not recognize that, oh, that's the spike protein. These antibodies need to attack it. So that, that's why the importance on the mutation uh, and on the spike protein particularly. Okay. Okay. Um, and then is it true that the new variant is targeting children more? Uh, I'm not aware of that, no. I think what we have in general seen, though, is that children are getting more COVID. They're mm -hmm. getting more COVID because they're not vaccinated. And so if we're seeing higher rates in children, it may just be because they don't, they're in general not vaccinated, not fully vaccinated compared to, to others. Right, right. Um, do you think this new variant is serious enough to put us back into lockdown? Well, I think it's going to depend on how well the vaccines work against this variant. How right. well does the vaccine spread? I think we've learned a lot about COVID. I think, you know, if we can have very high vaccination rates, have proof of vaccination, wear masks, keep physical distance, well, then we know that we can continue doing some things uh, safely. But we, you know, it's really hard to predict where COVID is going uh, in our city and in our province. So we're going to have to actually adapt based on the current circumstance. Right. And doctor, have there been cases of the Omicron variant detected in Toronto? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, not in Toronto yet. Right. Okay. Um, and the, let's see. Okay. The next question. Um, what other public health measures are coming into play to fight this new variant? Well, let's, not lose the ones that we already have and so I think you know it's really important that we continue with that masking again if you have even one symptom of COVID get tested stay home and get tested um, you know because that's how we're going to detect uh, additional cases and prevent the spread we know physical distancing it has worked with the other variants it will work this time around we know, again, the indoor settings are that higher risk setting. So stay outdoors or avoid those indoor gatherings for now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's continue with what we know that works. And I think based on case rates, hospital admission, ICU admissions, where we end up with, um, with COVID, we'll have to rely on our provincial governments to see whether additional restrictions need to be added. Right, right. Um, and then uh, again, I feel like there's a, a little bit of repetition, but we're going to take this question anyway. Um, does the new variant lead to even more severe illness than Delta? Yeah, we don't we don't know that just yet. I think what we can safely say, though, is that being unvaccinated puts you at higher risk for getting severe illness in mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. from Delta, from from Alpha. 
So I think getting vaccinated is probably the first first thing that I would say for anyone who is not vaccinated and is worried about this variant. Right. Um, and the next question, will there be a new or modified vaccine for Omicron um, that we will have to take again in another six months, even after these boosters that are going to go into effect uh, next year? It's not clear right now. So I think we'll have to wait for the science to do the analysis to see if we even need a specific uh, Omicron type of vaccine. Right. We might not need that. Again, we haven't needed a specific change in our vaccine for the variants that we've already had uh, circulating in Ontario, like the Alpha, like the Delta. Right, right. Um, and then we were talking about travel a little bit earlier, doctor. So do all travelers have to isolate upon arrival in, in uh, Canada now? Uh, so you'll have to be clear. It depends on where you're going. So if you're going to the U.S., it's different rules compared to going abroad. Um, you will have to come back, isolate until your first test is negative. Mm -hmm. Depending upon where you go, you may have to isolate for the full 14 days. So please do check the federal government's travel um, requirements. Right. Because it will be very specific based on where you've gone. Yes, it's no. I don't think it's a, a, a blanket sort of thing now. It's sort of a country specific for sure. Um, okay. Do you think that schools will be shut down again because of Omicron? I certainly hope not. I mean, we are keeping a close eye on this. Uh, our goal really is to have children learning in person. We know that that is the best place for children to learn. I mean, we're, we're watching our, our numbers and our outbreaks very closely. We certainly haven't seen, again, Omicron come yet to our city. We will expect it. We will expect, though, that those layers that we have in schools, the masking, the cohorting, the screening every day before you come, that those will be uh, important. Mm -hmm. If you look at where we are right now in schools today compared to December 1st last year, we're certainly seeing less outbreaks um, in schools. And so that is, uh, you know, something to, again, to just to keep a close eye on. Right, right. Um, and then next question, has the new variant already spread worldwide? Is it everywhere? Uh, I'm not sure that it's everywhere. Um, it's hard to know whether it's being detected in some places. Uh, I think, you know, if it is, it really is uh, the next variant, we can expect that it will be everywhere in the world. Um, but it will certainly depend on the testing that they have in the individual countries as well. Right, absolutely. Um, and the next question, if this variant is milder, does that mean COVID-19 is getting weaker? Or is it possible that the next variant could be even worse than the Delta variant? Yeah, there's a, a lot of really ball questions. questions. And I th yeah, I think we just don't know. I think what we've seen, for example, with the Delta variant, the Delta variant is was a more severe illness. It got landed people in hospital. But if you were vaccinated and if you happened to get Delta, you got a milder illness, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I think, you know, we also have to look at what's the role of vaccine and sometimes vaccines can, you know, you may still get to the infection, but it's milder. It will keep you out of hospital. So we, we have to keep a close eye on that as well. Right. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. Can you get the Omicron variant and the Delta variant at the same time? You know, I'm not sure about at the same time, but I think that's one of the questions about variants is whether you can get a reinfection. So what that means is that you got COVID, you got COVID um, maybe a couple of months ago. What what uh, the early reports have said, and of course I can't substantiate this, but this is what we know about variants is that even if you had COVID, you can get COVID again with the new variant, that the COVID that you had will not protect you from the new variant. And that is certainly one of the reasons why we recommend vaccination. Right. Even if you had COVID, get vaccinated because we know vaccines will give you that longer term protection against the new variant. Okay. Okay, um, and then let's take this last uh, Omicron question, but you can keep uh, your live questions coming in if you still have more about the variant. These are just the end of our submitted questions. Um, what happened to the original COVID? Has it been eradicated and have Delta and this new variant taken over? 
Well, it looks like in Ontario, it's pretty much Delta, 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 Delta. Like there's even the Alpha variant is really not much present and neither the original strain. So I'm not sure that we can say it's been eradicated, but we can say um, that the Delta variant is our predominant strain here right now. Okay. Okay, let's move on to some uh, general questions and also questions that we, uh, that we couldn't get to last week. Um, let's talk about the kids vaccine. That was our topic last week. So Perry asks, has there been any decision on children who are 11 and of adult height and weight and if they should get the adult dose or the child dose? Yes, so uh, recommend that they get the vaccine based on their age. The vaccines are not weight-based, so um, it is based on the age, and the age is because it depends on the immune system, and the immune system is very closely tied to the age. So even if you have, as even I do, a, you know, a 10 or 11-year-old that may be bigger than a 12 or 13-year-old that you know, hmm. get them the vaccine based on their current age. Right. If they're 11 right now, give them the dose, the pediatric dose. If they turn 12 before their second um doses do, then they will get the dose of a 12 year old. Okay. Um, and then Nas asks, uh, do, you, do I have to wait to get a COVID-19 vaccine if, the, if my nine year old got the flu shot 10 days ago? Should they wait? So the recommendation is to have about a two week period before uh, between vaccines. So, but it's, it's not a firm 14 days, it is a precaution. So if it was 10 days ago that you got the flu vaccine, that would be okay for you to get the COVID vaccine. Um, but as a general principle, the, the rule is to, you know, have about two weeks before um, so that you don't get a vaccine before you get your COVID. And then when you get your COVID vaccine, wait two weeks before you get another vaccine afterwards. Right. And doctor, you had mentioned that's because uh, just in case there are certain side effects that you want to make sure are from that you want to basically differentiate the, the side effects from each vaccine, right? Exactly. So if you got a fever, you weren't feeling well after and you wanted to be able to sure, be sure, well, it was this vaccine that caused that. Right. Now I know when I get this vaccine again, what I should look out for. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. And then this is from Anonymous. Um, if we are not having any unmasked contact and everyone, uh, including children, has the Pfizer vaccine now, um, how necessary is it to get the flu shot this year if your child is wearing a well-fitting mask at school? So we know influenza can spread uh, similar to COVID and we know that, you know, wearing a mask is helpful, mm -hmm. but we know that masks are not 100%. Uh, we know that influenza can actually survive on surfaces as well, better than COVID can, for example. So there are a lot of good reasons to get the flu shot, especially for children, because children, especially young children, less than five, they can get actually very sick from influenza. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, this, I think this is from a person who's clearly tired of COVID as, as we all are. Frank asks, considering that the virus is not life-threatening, when can we drop all of these controls and all of these measures and go back to normal? So the virus is actually life-threatening for some people. Um, that I think has been very clearly shown. We still have people in our ICU, over 100 in the province, who are in the ICU because they have a COVID infection. So there's no question that this virus is life-threatening um, for some. And I think what we saw, uh, you know, in places like Alberta uh, in the summer was when you just to decide to let everything go, you end up with a lot of people who get COVID some people who get very, very sick from COVID and have to seek health care. And you can run out of health care, actually. You can run out of the ability to look after people if you just let things go. So now is not the time to do that. Um, especially hospitals are also seeing people who are getting the other viruses that are spreading in right. children, it's the RSV virus that can make them very sick. We know influenza is here, even though it's not fully spreading, it may start to spread. And then the other common viruses that are spreading are enterovirus and rhinovirus. Right. Um, and that's making a lot of people uh, get colds and, and not feel well as well. Right, absolutely. Um, and doctor, just because we're on this topic, it's been 
almost two years now. For you as a public health official, what can you say to people to stay the course just a little longer, you know, continue following all our measures? What can you say to encourage people? I think we've made great progress. Like if I think back and you think back to December last year, we were in a very different place. And I know it feels like, you know, it's, it's too much. I can't handle it anymore. No, I mean, we're still doing much more this December than we did last December. We're not back to our routine of life before COVID. That's true, but we are certainly much better ahead than we were. And I think vaccines have certainly made a very big difference. We've also moved the needle on our vaccination rates. And I think that's something that we can continue to do. And then to boost vaccines, especially if you're a senior, for example, or have a weak immune system, need that extra protection to get it. Um, and so I think, you know, don't lose heart. You know, we're, we're talking about some things that I think are going to be easier to do, like wearing a mask or being outdoors. Like that's going to be easier than a, a, a strict lockdown, um, which, which was what we had last year. Right, absolutely. Um, and then, Doctor, we were talking about booster shots a little while ago. How will the booster rollout for the general public uh, play out? Are we going to be contacted? Or do we have to book appointments? Do we have any um, sort of clarity on that? I think there will be more announcements coming out uh, this week, next week, in terms of the recommendations for booster doses. What we've seen so far is, for example, in 70 plus who have been recommended for a booster dose, it is six months after your second dose. So we'll have to see what the interval is as well, too. Um, I'm not sure that when you're due for a booster dose that you will get a phone call. Um, I'm not sure that that is going to happen. So I think it really everyone needs to check their own eligibility, you know, go back and check your record to see when did you last have your dose mm -hmm. and who is eligible for, for uh, getting a vaccine. Right. Okay. Um, and then this is an interesting one. Uh, M asks, just wondering if there has been any data collected from individuals who have autism who have received their vaccination. I know an individual whose executive functioning has diminished significantly since being vaccinated. Okay, so there certainly are no links between autism and um, the vaccine. Um, so I think that um, is something, you know, like the people who have adverse events following vaccination, that is certainly something that is being closely monitored. I know as a physician, you know, last week when I was in the emergency department, I saw a young a uh, man with autism who was vaccinated, it was challenging for him, but he got vaccinated, was there in the emergency department because he wasn't feeling well, but that doesn't mean that it was caused by the vaccine. Right, right, yes, and we, the, the, I think we've talked about this several times, is that sort of determining that causality is the, is the crux of, the, of, of whether it's a side effect or not, right? That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess we've already answered this question. How are variants um, created? Is it because um, people are moving back and forth between unvaccinated and vaccinated people? Or is it just because you know more people are unvaccinated? Yeah, the variants uh, develop. So variant means a change in the virus or a mutation in the virus. And they tend to occur when the virus spreads, when it spreads to each person. Every time it spreads to a person, that's a chance for the virus to change itself. And so that's how mutations develop. So in order to prevent variants, in order to prevent those mutations, you actually have to prevent the spread of the virus. Right, absolutely. Um, and let's take G's question. G asks, when will the province take into account immunity from previous COVID infections like Europe? Um, and it says that Quebec only requires one dose for those who, who have previously tested positive for COVID. So uh, there are ways in which if you've had a previous COVID infection, it is taken into account. So if you were a close contact of someone, uh, if you had a COVID infection in the last 90 days, you would not have to self-isolate. We are certainly seeing, though, that there, even in Ontario, evidence of people who have had a previous infection who are getting reinfected. And so the, the recommendations still are if you had a COVID infection, as long as you're cleared from isolation, get vaccinated right away. Do not wait because your risks of getting another COVID infection are still present. 
Right, absolutely. And I'm just going to squeeze in this last question in the last one minute that we have. Uh, Rob says, uh, I'm based in the UK and took part in the Novavax phase three vaccine trials. Um, I have flights booked to travel to Toronto to visit family over Christmas, but since Canada doesn't recognize Novavax, I've had one shot of Pfizer. Um, given that Novavax has applied for approval in the UK, should I hold off on getting my second Pfizer shot uh, in the hopes that uh, you know Canada will accept Novavax once it's approved in the UK? Okay, so two points to make here. One is that Novavax, uh, as you know, is not approved yet here. So, mm -hmm. and I can't certainly give you a timeline for when it may be approved. It's really hard to predict those things. Okay. But the second is to say that as of November 30th, the federal government did add additional vaccines. So if Novavax is a WHO approved vaccine, which I believe it is, then if you are fully vaccinated with that vaccine, you can come to Canada. Right and uh, have different, you will be considered fully vaccinated from a federal government um, travel perspective. But again, things are always changing now, especially with Omicron. So please do check the, our, our federal travel uh, requirement website. Right, absolutely. Okay, and that brings us to 101. Uh, thank you for that extra minute, doctor. Um, thank you to everybody that sent in your questions. If we didn't get to your question, we will try to get to it next week. We will have the doctor back with us then. For now, we will say thank you and bye-bye.